So let's talk a little bit about how we solve these transit problems. Um, if they're simple, we can actually work them out ourselves by hand. I mean, a lot of times in engineering, things boil down to the solution of a first or second order differential equation. And when I go through and, and do all the different use cases, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get everything set up where at least I can approximate it using a first or second order differential equation. And I think this is very useful because what it does is it kind of gives you a handle on the form of the solution. And, and I know you guys right now got all sorts of simulation programs you can plug something into and you can get the answer. But if you're sitting in a meeting with lots of other engineers and, you know, a certain scenario comes up, um, you know, you can't really sit there and say, well, I, I need to go home and uh, run a whole thousand simulations on this and I'll come back tomorrow with an answer. I mean, really, if you're sitting in a meeting, you should kind of know, well, roughly based on this problem, you know, I would expect, expect the stress level to be a two or three times nominal voltage. I mean, you, you got to know enough about the form of these solutions where you, you, can, you can make that type of uh, statement. But there are a lot of scenarios that we can't solve by hand. Once you get above second order, maybe you can solve a third order, but other than that, things get kind of complicated. And so this is where we have a lot of tools that we would use. And the, the tools we're going to use in this class are going to be PSCAD and MATLAB Simulink, uh, more specifically the Power System Toolbox. For PSCAD, I'll get into a little bit how you can access that. But PSCAD is one of the more traditional programs that Power System engineers would do that enables you to draw on a circuit and actually to do the simulation. And then MATLAB also has this add-on in Simulink. It has a, something you can load into Simulink that would kind of help you solve some of these different sort of transits as well. These aren't the only simulation tools, but they're the ones we're going to be using in this class. Uh, in general, what these are called is these are called EMT solvers. Um, EMT stands for electromagnetic transits. And this would be in tools like you use if you took the protection class like ETAP, uh, Siemens, SynCal, a lot of other vendors are going to have these EMT calculation modules in there. But we're going to be focusing on PSCAD and, and using MATLAB and Simulink. This is if you want to just solve something and do some analysis, but it's not going to give you an answer in, in real time. It's going to take a, it's have to do a lot of number crunching in order to get the, the answers. There is value actually though in doing what we call real-time simulation. And so if you're trying to evaluate like a microgrid control and you want to know whether this microgrid control is going to work under realistic field conditions, then you have to have real-time signals feeding into that microgrid controller. And so this is where you get into what we call these hardware and loop testing systems where you're either driving the controller with a real-time simulation or if you have a power amplifier, you can do power hardware in the loop testing, we're actually able to supply kind of like utility level power signals to this device. To do that, then there's tools um, from companies that make this special type of equipment like uh, RTDS. This is kind of compatible with PSCAD, by the way. Uh, Opal RT is another Canadian company that does this stuff, which is based on Simulink. And if you simply want to play signals back, um, you have Mager and Overcron that are companies um, that make this sort of equipment as well. Yeah, so let me get to these questions at the end. Um, I've seen a few chat questions posted up, and I'll talk about this at the end after I kind of get through this, this overview. So, for example, for fault current analysis, um, this shows a scenario kind of similar to that transit recovery voltage um, thing I talked about at the beginning of class, where you have a source model that you have, it's highly inductive, but then you also have a little bit of resistance you might want to model as well. You've got a breaker that's going to clear the fault, and you have some small amount of capacitance in here, which record represents the bus capacitance. If you're going to analyze the circuit by hand using steady state analysis, I mean, you can model this in the phaser domain. What you'd see if you have a fault here is you're going to get about 
12.5 kiloamperes of fault current. But however, what, what else can you see if you're, if you're doing transit analysis in this case? So this actually shows the results of a PSCAD simulation. What we're doing is we're running this at a time step of one millisecond. What this means is in the numerical engine that's doing this calculation, what we're doing is we're doing a calculation, we're updating the voltage and current that we're calculating every one millisecond. And so this is what's referred to as a time step. And you'll see later on, we talk about numerical simulation, what's the significance of the time step. If we make the time step small, we get more accuracy, but if the time step small, we have to do more iterations to get the simulation to run. So in this case, we did this at one millisecond, which is like a 16th of a, of a cycle. What we're seeing is we're seeing the source voltage. You can see the reference voltage. And when the fault occurs, what this does is it puts a dead short at the breaker. So the voltage drops down to zero, but look what happens to the current. This current does eventually get into steady state, but before it gets in a steady state, we have a transit that occurs. In this case, what we see is we see a DC offset in the current. And so what's the significance of this? What this means is the peak current that that breaker's gotta be able to withstand is not this peak current that you would calculate using phaser analysis, but the peak current that you would calculate using transit analysis. And what we'll see when we go through this on Wednesday is this amount of peak depends on the, the ratio of the reactants to the resistance in this particular system here. So depending on the nature of the source and depending on when the fault occurs, what portion of the cycle, we're gonna get different types of peak current. So that's one thing you can kind of see from this transit analysis is what's kind of going on in terms of a DC offset. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is when the fault is cleared, if you take a look at this voltage, it looks like the voltage goes back to normal. And this is what you see if you did your analysis at one millisecond. But what happens if I drop the time step down and look at this at one microsecond? Well, now what we see is we see a ringing transit on that breaker voltage that could actually jump up to about two times the normal voltage, two times the nominal voltage. And so this is what we call transit recovery voltage, which we not would have even seen unless we dropped down to such a small time step because this is, this is such a high frequency, all right? So this is something else you see in doing transit analysis as, you know, sometimes you don't even see the event with regular recording equipment unless you really drop the, the time step down where you can actually see this particular type of phenomena. So anyway, this, this is gonna to relate to the material we'll be covering this semester on um, looking at fault analysis and also looking at transit recovery voltage. Um, okay, anyway, this just kind of summarizes some of the things you see in terms of the peak magnitude. And the fact this is occurring at such a high frequency, which is associated with, a, with the term we're gonna see quite often this semester is one of the square root of LC. That's gonna be the frequency associated with an LC type of a circuit. And if you divide that by two pi, you can actually get that in terms of kilohertz. Um, in order to analyze this for, for your homeworks and your projects, what you guys can do is one of two things. There's a free version of PSCAD that you can download, it's what's called a student version, from the company um, that makes the software. And so if you want to find this link, just Google PSCAD free, and you can actually load this on your laptops. Uh, another alternative, if you can't get this to load on your PC for whatever reason, or if you have a Macintosh since it's more of a PC program, is, and I'll put some other instructions out for this, um, NC State also has a server-based approach for making PC software available called BCL. And so if you go to this particular site, there's some instructions how to use this. But this actually runs on a PC emulator, if you want to think about it that way. And what you can do is you can sign up, put in a reservation for using this Blade server, and you could actually log on from your laptop, just like you're logging on to the regular version of PSCAD. And the advantage of this particular version 
is this is our regular educational version that actually has more capability for a number of your nodes. And so this maybe would come in useful for the project where you want to kind of do a bigger, bigger system. All right. Uh, another example of transits is, is looking at power electronics. And so a single phase inverter is something you would see like on a residential rooftop PV or converting the DC into AC. And this particular simulation is running in MATLAB and Simulink using Power System Toolbox. A lot of times it's easier to do the control systems in MATLAB and Simulink. And so sometimes, a lot of times we'll switch over our power electronic simulation over to MATLAB and Simulink. But in this case, what we have is we have a DC source. We're, we're just modeling the PV panels as a constant DC source. And you have these four switches, these four IGBTs. And so basically when I gate these devices, if they're forward biased, they're gonna operate. And by doing the appropriate switching of these devices, what you can do is you can get an AC output on the system side of the, this filter right here. So the scheme that we use in this case is what's called pulse width modulation, which we'll talk about later on during the semester. This is switching at a very high frequency. And what we're gonna see as far as directly out of the output of the inverter, is we're gonna see a bunch of square waveforms, which look like this. Kind of looks, you know, kind of look like a mess as far as AC is nothing you would recognize. However, after you run this through the filter, some type of an LC or LCL filter, what you do is you filter out the higher frequency components and you're left with your more conventional 60 hertz AC. There's some high harmonics still in here. But what the filtering does is it filters out the higher frequencies. And so what we'll be kind of looking at in this class would be, well, what's the harmonic content? We can actually take these waveforms and we can actually process them and we can figure out, well, what's the harmonics in terms of the non-60 hertz components, as well as do things like look at the control system. Um, if you haven't used MATLAB and Simulink before, uh, there's a website for NCSU you can go to where you can actually download this. And what you want to make sure of is that when you have this downloaded, that you make sure you keep the uh, Simscape power system still um, working on, that you don't disable that. And so anyway, we'll be using that more in the latter part of the semester. We'll be focused on using PSCAD more first and uh, simulate a little bit later. Yeah. And then there's a note here about reactance resistance determines the slope. Yeah. And so, so basically, yeah, what we're going to see in here is what's going to be the impact of the X to R ratio in determining, you know, what this um, peak value is going to be for the current. Still another scenario where we have to use another type of modeling is line energization. And so if you have three phase line and if you're energizing a single phase, as soon as you close the switch, what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be sending a pulse down this line. You're gonna be sending a square wave, square wave pulse down this line. And when it hits a discontinuity, there's gonna be reflection down here and basically this pulse is gonna reflect back and forth, and what you're going to have is you're going to, you're going to have a transit associated with this. Um, this is a very common type of scenario on transmission. Uh, also happens on distribution circuits, but the impact's more kind of fell, I guess, at, at the transmission level. We could use our old model, like this pi equivalent model with resistance, capacitance, etc. But in order to model this traveling wave effect, we'd have to have a lot of these small little pi equivalent sections in series. And so it's not really always practical to do that. And so we're also going to be talking about what we call distributed parameter models. And this is what you have to get into if you're talking about some of these um, higher speed types of switching events. Um, this actually shows what you get as a result of doing this line energization. You know that after a while, you would eventually get in a steady state. And eventually what we'd be seeing is we'd be seeing sinusoidal voltages or currents. But what you see from this simulation right here 
um, if you're looking at the voltages and currents, um, what you're going to be seeing is you're going to see a high speed transit, which is going to happen right when the switching action occurs. What we're concerned about is what's the peak value on this line? Are we going to maybe um, go over any sort of insulation on this, on this particular circuit right here? And so, you know, this enables us to kind of look at peak stress. Something also interesting is we also see some of this voltage induced on the other phases because of mutual coupling. And then finally, something we'll get in more toward the end of the semester is microgrid control. This is actually a more sophisticated example from a, a research project that NC State is doing for the Department of Energy right now. But basically this shows a microgrid where what we're trying to do is take utility scale PV, in this case, this is a five megawatt plant. And in combination with two MBA energy storage device, what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore load at the distribution level directly. So this would be a scenario you may want to have if you have utility scale PV, but you don't have a transmission grid to synchronize it to, what are you going to do? Well, in this case, what we're doing is we have a grid forming device in the form of this energy storage device. And what it does is it basically provides the voltage source that this inverter, PV inverter needs in order to synchronize. And so what we're doing in this case is we're turning on these loads one by one. And so what you see in this diagram is you see the, the PV and the energy storage online. Initially, what's happening is the battery is being charged up by the PV. And then what we're doing is we're adding this load in steps. And we're modulating not only the energy storage system output, but the PV output as well. And, and the way we're actually doing this is we're doing this what we, through what we call MPPT control. So you can actually do this as long as the power output is less than what you can actually get um, due to the irradiance uh, on the on the PV panels. So, so anyway, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more toward the end of the semester, like what's involved in this microgrid control. But this is like where you start looking at a transit analysis that's associated with modeling the controls now on this power electronics and what are the interactions of these different controllers taking place through the power grid. Okay, as uh, far as um, tools you would have for doing this stuff in real time, you know, for research, we have a lot of these different sort of tools in NC State. Um, these are really kind of expensive systems. I mean, these systems kind of would be running you like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you had this simulation running on PSCAD, we can actually load a PSCAD simulation on this special purpose hardware. And we can actually run this in real time and hook up inverters and relays and things to this. Uh, another option we have for doing real-time simulation is using simulators from a company called Hopeful RT. This little microgrid simulation here not only runs on Simulink, but we also have this running on this real-time simulator as well. And so what we can do is we can hook this up to different devices like controllers and stuff and simulate how these controllers would work in real time on this type of microgrid simulation. And if all you want to do is simply play back these waveforms into a relay, um, you know, we have these amplifiers, these power amplifiers. Um, we actually have these in um, the 586 lab in EV2, where if you have voltages and currents, you can actually amplify those and you could feed those back into a relay. So if I had a PSCAD run, I could take the file associated with that 